So if you have listened to or have read about destiny, there is a very, very common quote. I'll read the quote to you. The quality of your thoughts determine your actions. Your actions develop your habit. Your habit create your character, and your character forges your destiny. We've heard that? Familiar? All right. Now, there are so many quotations about destiny, about all of that. There's another one that I think would be simpler. And here's what I would propose. Just be mindful of who you're with, where you are, and what you're working for. That's it. Just think of who you're with, where you are, and what you're working for. You see, when we got into this text, this is probably a very strange text to preach on because it is genealogies. And we're going to go through, uh, we're going to, this sermon is about the whole chapter, but we're not going to read the whole chapter. Okay, but it's about the whole chapter. The Old Testament numbers and the Old Testament genealogies are probably the most difficult texts when you're reading them because it's it's strange. It's like, why, why am I reading this? What is the point? Why did God put this here for me in the 21st century? Right? These people lived 4,000 years ago, and we have a struggle with relating with them. The difference, though, between reading genealogies as a lineage and reading genealogies as history is where we need to focus on. When you read Old Testament histories, you pay attention to not only what is being said, but you pay attention to what is not being said and what has been said about the context. And that's one of the techniques for how we read these genealogies. And it takes just a little bit of extra prayer and extra patience, and God shows His faithfulness by instructing us even from these very strange texts, okay? Uh, maybe the word strange is not the right word. Maybe the word would be um, far removed or di relate text, right? So we're going to have a different style of preaching today. Normally, our preaching is kind of like spill the tea, T-E-A, text, exegesis, application, right? Or oil spa. Today, it's going to be a little different. We're going to look at the macro view of the, the characters, and then after that, we're going to look at the micro observations. Okay? So the text we read talks about the gener generations of Esau. And if you'll notice in verse 1, he says, these are the generations of Esau, and then there's a parenthesis. That is Edom. And if you read the whole Genesis 36, God or Moses or God through Moses repeats that all the time. This is Edom. This is Edom. This is Edom. It's, it's as if God is trying to say something without saying it. It's like a Padumug style effect of writing. Okay? And then he says in verse 2, Esau took his wives from the Canaanites. And you already know, uh oh, this, is, this doesn't sound very good. This is, doesn't sound very promising. And yet, when you read it, it sounds like he did something wrong, but he was rewarded for it. If you read Genesis 36, the whole chapter, it's interesting. It even says here, after all the names, see Basimath, see Nebaioth, see Eliphaz, see Ruel, all of that. You will see here in verse 6, Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, all his beasts, all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan. He went into a land away from his brother Jacob. He went away, all right? So after reading that, you see here their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. The land of their sojournings could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. And then there's another parenthesis. It says Esau is Edom. There we go again. And if you read the Old Testament, you're going to know that Edom is not a very positive word. Edom has always been like an enemy of God and etc., and then in verse 9, it says, These are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites. And people would wonder, why, why, why the stress on Edom, Edomites? Why is this such a big deal? If you read all throughout the history of Israel, Edom has been an enemy. They've always been at war. They've always fought. They've always had issues. And we're going to look at some initial observations first. 
So this is probably the last time we're going to go to the text. We're going to go straight to the observations. Esau was extremely successful according to the world. If you read the entire Genesis 36, all of it, the word chief was mentioned 19 times. The word reign was mentioned 10 times. So Esau not only founded a kingdom, he was the founder of a dynasty. He's that successful. Can you imagine? Like, now we're so against political dynasties and all of that. But before, if you had a dynasty, that was a big deal. It was a huge positive thing. And so according to the world, Esau was super successful. He was extremely rich with beautiful women in his harem. So he had power. He had you know, authority. He had influence. He had riches. He had wealth. He was remembered for generations to come. Everyone would sing his praises. Oh, of course, who's the father of this kingdom? Esau. Who, who created his dynasty? Esau. Whose father are you? Esau. He was remembered. People probably wanted to be his friend or ally because obviously if he was powerful and you were not an ally, that's scary. You know, you, they wanted his protection. They wanted his allegiance or his, his favor to do trade, to do business, commerce, all of that. Now, if we think about it for ourselves, how many of us crave the successes of this life? How many of us would say, man, oh man, I wish I had Isao's success. Maski pisik lang. You know, maybe like 10%. Not really a dynasty. Maybe one generation or two. Right? We, we crave that. We want that. We want to feel special. We want to feel unique. We want to feel we have arrived. Diba? Naka-achieve, naka-arrived. And yet, we're all getting older. We're all running out of time to be great in the world's eyes. I look at my age. I'm 39. I'm turning 40. And I'm excited about it. And I'm thinking, at 40 years old, what have I accomplished? And then you start to get insecure. You start to think, Halaka, your time is running out in this world. And then after that, w- would you have like a building name to yourself? Would you? I don't know. But is that really supposedly our goal? If God is sovereign, why does it feel like He's preventing us from entering our time to shine? Have you felt that? Like, you, you try, God says no. Try harder, God says no harder. <laughs> you try hardest, and then God's just sometimes going to remind you, and you're like, man, Lord, why? And then you have all those prayers. It's for your glory. I'm doing this for you. <laughs> That usually happens. Why did Moses include this in the genealogy? Remember this. When Moses wrote Genesis, the people were about to conquer the land of Canaan while Moses was writing. Okay, so the moment he was writing, they were about to conquer. The Edomites were Esau's descendants and lived near Canaan. So picture it. Canaan, promised land, Edomites, very near the vicinity, like border area. Okay, border area. And Moses, through the Jews, uh, talked to the Edomites and said, we want to pass through your land to get to Canaan. And Moses even said, you know, whatever expenses we incur, we're going to pay you back. Okay, so utang lang, but, but we will pay you back. And the Edomites said no. The Edomites in Numbers chapter 20, you don't have to go there, but if you want to remember lang, Numbers chapter 20, uh, a lot of people felt angry towards the Edomites. Why won't they let us go through? Diba, Abraham, our same father, and how come you're treating us this way? Okay, so there was parang, you know, like some bad blood there. To the point that some people may have even thought of revenge after conquering Canaan. Like, Kamuha, you didn't let us get through your land. So once we're done with Canaan, you're next. You know, that's kind of like how the Jews could have felt. And yet, God wrote this in the Bible to remind them, especially in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 2 to 5, that there's no point in attacking Edom since God did not want the Jews to have anything to do with those people. You don't have to try to get there because I don't want you there. You don't even have to feel bad that they didn't allow you to pass because I don't want you to even pass there anyway, lest you get influenced. And yet today in this world, we have resentment towards the successes of others, the world's successes, what people have accomplished, And we kind of have resentment towards the God who prevents us, right? Because here it was the Edomites who prevented them. 
For us today, it's really God who's preventing us because God is sovereign. And yet we have resentment towards God. God, why? And God could be saying to us, you don't need to have resentment towards me because I don't want you to have anything to do with certain kinds of lifestyles. The living the life kind of Ferrari, Tesla cars, and the private jets kind of. Like, that's not the life. Our life is called to be different. We're supposed to focus on God first. And if we take a look at Genesis 37 verse 1, now this is going to be next week, but just a little advanced, uh, no, just one verse. Genesis 37 verse 1 says this, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. One very long chapter. If you read Genesis 36, the, this son reigned here, reigned there, reigned here, the chief, the chief, the chief, the chief, the chief. They left Jacob. They were so successful. And then, one whole chapter dedicated to worldly success, and then one verse just says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the promised land. You see the contrast? It's so stark, it's so huge, it's so, it's so subtle and yet so obvious at the same time. There's a contrast between Esau's life and legacies and choices versus Jacob's. When we read the scriptures, we have to remember the chapters and verses did not exist before. So when people would read this, they would say, Oh, Esau, wow, Esau, 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 Esau. Grabe, so successful. Jacob with his fathers. So it's always Esau, Edomite, ha? Edomite, 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 Edomite. And then Jacob was faithful. One verse. And that should give us so much comfort. Because you can hear the tone in God's voice when, or our voice when we read it. When we read scripture, we remember that Jacob lived in borrowed land while Esau lived in his own land. Esau had kings and dynasties and chiefs and rulers. Jacob's descendants become slaves. <laughs> what an opposite. Esau had multiple children. Jacob and Rachel suffered from infertility and had two. That's it. It seems that God provides His love on the cross and our sanctification not in the form of worldly comforts and luxuries. We tend to feel this way. If you really love me, God, prove it. How? God says cross, sanctification, discipline, growth, spiritual peace. And we say, I don't want any of that. I want what the world has. That's the danger and that's scary. Now, let's look at some specific observations. First, I, I said who you're with, where you are, and then lastly, what you're working for. First, who you fellowship with determines, determines your faith. Okay? Who you fellowship with determines your faith. So that's who you're with. In Genesis 24, verse 3, remember Abraham made his servant make a vow on his thigh. I call it the thigh vow. Or the thigh swear. You know, swear to me on my thigh. Like, it's kind of awkward, my lord. Like, <laughs> swear to me on my thigh that Isaac isn't going to marry one of those women of the land. Right? Uh, the names and meanings are so important. Names in earlier chapters and the names in this chapter are also very different. So Abraham said to the servant, swear to me, huh? Isaac will not marry anyone from the land. And then the servant said, mm, awkward swear, but cool. And then they go, they the servant finds a different a woman from the relatives. After that, last chapter we saw that the names were kind of uh, different from the names in this chapter, and there's a reason. We talked about names before. A change of names. Remember that my, my Chinese friend see nutrition. Okay, <laughs> all right. And then he, now he's called health. You know, health, not healthy health. See health. Here, if you read the chapter, the names have been changed again. They have been switched back. They renamed themselves according to Edomite culture. Picture that. People who are supposedly worshippers of God renamed themselves into pagan names. It's the opposite. Let me give you a few. Basimath means the perfumed one. Change her name to Ada, the adorned one, the bejeweled one, the one with the bling. Okay, Judith means the praised one, praised in a good way, in a godly way. She changed her name to Oholibama, meaning 
stately or powerful position or a woman of authority. Alright? Eliphaz means pure gold. Zerah means rising in power. They, they named themselves according to worldly stuff. Of the 81 names in the list, and if you want to count, you can do it because I had fun counting. Like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Of the 81 names on the list, only two hints at God. Reuel means friend of God, and Jeush means the Lord helps. So 79 names were renamed to worldly stuff. How tragic. So many kings, chiefs, rulers, dynasty, known for worldly success and spiritual abandonment. Esau's entire family was externally attractive, outwardly impressive, and today we have the same temptation. We want to be externally attractive and outwardly impressive. We want to show the world that as Christians, we are excellent for God, successful for the Lord. That's the impression we want to give to the world. It's so difficult for us to just be vulnerable. In fact, I would dare say it's a challenge for us to be vulnerable even among church members. You know, how are you? How are you? Everything's great. Everything's fine. Everything's colorful, roses and you know rainbows. Like, how's your marriage? Perfect, wonderful, excellent. No, no issues, none whatsoever. Wow. How's the spiritual walk? Twenty chapters. What? <laughs> like, we we pretend. We don't like being vulnerable. Many profess to be Christians, and yet it's super deceptive these days. I'm so sick and tired of people who claim Christ in their Facebook with all the selfies, with all the pictures and the verses, and yet their lifestyles are living inconsistencies. They're so, we talked about this last week. Remember ungodly friends versus ungodly friendships? Remember that? We said that it's possible for professing Christians who live ungodly lives and influence you toward ungodly decisions as well. It's very possible for two people to profess Christ, and yet sometimes their personalities are just a really bad mix. Maybe they've gone through some struggles in the past and it's just a bad, volatile combination. There's a chemical reaction. Others naman, you're a Christian, you're hanging out with people who profess Christ and yet live in an ungodly way. And they influence you into ungodliness. And then you end up thinking, Hala, why am I doing all these really terrible things now? Before Dili, man, I got influenced. But they, they said they were Christian. Very possible. In fact, here's what can happen. Our flesh enjoys their company so much, so we justify their inconsistent profession of faith. In fact, we justify and make excuses or even fuel their ungodly behavior so that we can indulge in their carnality. Then we wash our hands and say, they were the ones who were behaving carnally. I simply benefited from them. I just enjoyed it, but I didn't do it. And then we say, but to the pure, everything is pure. I'm pure, they're not. Uh, but actually your heart wanted them to continue those things so you can indulge. We end up craving compliments, we pose for the praises, and our purity is pretense. So I made a new hashtag. When purity is pretense, it's called puritense. <laughs> but be careful that we don't live that life, the puritense life. Second, where you are. So the first is who you're with. And we got this from Jacob, uh, from Esau, who left Jacob. He left the presence of godliness and he went to Edom. For us, we have a tendency sometimes, if I like, I don't want to talk to my Christian friends because they're, they're going to tell me the stuff that I need to hear but hurts. So I'm going to go hang out with my non-Christian friends and my worldly professing Christian friends because they're going to justify my carnality. So I go to them instead. And then when I go to my Christian friends, well, they said, eh. okay, careful. Who you're with. Next is where you are. Plant your roots where you're bearing fruits, if you want the rhymes. Okay, plant your roots where you're bearing fruits. Esau moved away because he was too rich. Sana all, no? 
He moved away because he was just too rich. The land could not contain them. Can you picture that for a moment? Why did you transfer? Too much stuff. Diba? I need more land. Grabe. But think about this. He did not stay where the source of his faith could be nourished. What he wanted nourishment for was not his faith. It was his stuff. It's repeated that Canaan is the land of promise. Since Abraham's time, it's repeated over and over again. And yet, Esau valued secular success over godly guidance. Remember the Lord in Laodicea in Revelation? In Revelation 3, the Lord says to the church in Laodicea, You say I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. Can you, can you imagine being able to say that? I'm so rich, I'm in need of nothing. And yet, you do not know that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Hurts. Today, we have very similar temptations. There's physical distance and proximity that actually affects spiritual growth. That's why face-to-face -face meetings are vital. Kind of online, online, that's so difficult. Like, yes, when the government said we cannot, then we obey the government, Romans 13, but you felt it. I felt it. It's the, you know, it's like a dog panting for water and your tongue is hanging out. Like, Lord, spiritual water, please. Wala na man. So it's so crucial. When, when we saw, I saw a picture of Ukrainian Christians. They were called to hide in their homes. You know what one church did? All of them decided to meet under a kanang subway nila. All of them met underground. And they started singing praises in the middle of war. It's so encouraging. Choosing where you live determines how you will live. If you live faithful or faithless, it's strongly determined by where you are. Please don't think as long as there's a church. Think of where you're bearing fruit. There are times we have to transfer, yes, but there are times when we don't, but we panic, and so we transfer just because we think we have to to survive, and yet our spiritual life is what dies. There is, there is so many excuses. As long as there's a church there, as long as I know someone there, I have a friend who's a pastor there anyway, you know, those words can be so scary. Please make your choices based on Christ, not career. Based on Christ and your fruitfulness in the Lord, not safety. Not any of those. I'm reminded of Elimelech from the book of Ruth. Remember him? Elimelech, husband of Ruth, lived in Bethlehem. But God was giving Bethlehem a famine because Bethlehem was being disciplined. And Elimelech, he left Bethlehem. And what happened? He died. And then his sons died. And Abilin were the women. And so we see, when he left where God wanted him to be, that's where he experienced actual, well, for his case, physical death, like literal death. And for many times for us, oh, I just need to survive. I gotta get out of here. I gotta go somewhere else. That's where I'll survive. That, you, know, you know the saying, grass is greener on the other side? Let me just say, grass is greener when you water it. Don't think of where the other side is. And many times when you go to the other side, it's not greener. It's really not. It's, you, you feel lost. You feel like, oh, this isn't home. And then you just want to go home. You want to go back to where you know you were growing in the Lord. First, it's who you're with. Next is where you are. The third one is what you're working for. Prioritize God's purposes. God promised to Jacob that kings would come from him. Remember? There was an echo of a promise from Abraham, then to Isaac, then to Jacob. Kings would come after you. Can you picture it for a moment if there was social media during their time? Imagine if Esau had Instagram. Picture it for a moment. And Jacob had Instagram. And then, mag-selfie si Esau sa iyang son, himog chief. Another son, chief. Selfie. Chief, coronation, look at this crown, really cool. Can you, can, can you picture Jacob? Lord, you promised kings would come from me. And yet, scrolling down, 
Lord, are you sure the promise was to me, not to him? Because it seems like he's getting the promise. Nabali? Was there a birthright ex re exchange? I, right? Sounds strange that Esau had all the chiefs and Jacob had eventually slaves. Imagine social media during this time when they were in Egypt enslaved. Picture it. Facebook newsfeed on this side is all success and on this side carrying bricks again, stepping on the mud, making clay, <laughs> cardio. <laughs> it, it's, so, it's so painful to, to look at. And I say this because it's painful for us when we go on our social media. We scroll down the newsfeed, may pasila, may pasila, Lord, what about me? Where's my time to shine? Diba? Look at them traveling now. Wala pa ganila human ang COVID issue. They're traveling now. So, right? So many questions, right? But look at the end. Edom eventually becomes enemies of God and enemies of Israel. In the end, God redeems Israel. God often, very often actually, even in our lives, repeats how Edom becomes their enemy. If you read the Old Testament, it's over and over again, God says, Edom did this, Edom did that, Edom did this. It makes me wonder, ba, like God, okay, if I could talk to God, God, okay, okay, okay. You keep saying, Edom did this, Edom did that, Edom did this. And yet, successful, 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 successful. So Lord, if you're sovereign, why do you keep, it's like a mixed message. You're saying on one hand, Edom is your enemy, and yet on the other hand, you're, you're allowing them to get so blessed. Today, it, it feels the same, and I'm telling you guys, this is my prayer too. Like, literally, this is, this is my prayer sometimes. Lord, you say, the worldly, worldly possessions will, will just harm me, will just, and yet you're giving it to them, to them, to them, to them, to them, to them. Oh, it doesn't make sense. Lord, you're giving me mixed messages. I don't understand. But actually, I'm just emotionally idolizing. I'm just having some idols in my heart, so I'm complaining because of that. The result of seeking worldly success above godly guidance is to become an enemy of God. Make no mistake, this will always happen. Once you seek whatever worldliness it is, not just success, don't just think of the Tesla cars and the Porsche and the Ferraris. I'm talking about any kind of worldly success. It could be success in your romance. Na, oh, romantic, Ayusha. Look at, look at where we went to our date. Where, look at, where, you know, private jet, the, whatever. Like, it doesn't have to be that. Maragwa, may pa sila date night every night. There's only one day of the week mo sila ga date. <laughs> like, picture it. Like, I'm, I'm just saying this as ano ha, like, anything. It could be romance, it could be finances, it could be just friends. Wow, every time there's a party, they're invited to every party. Maski stranger. Nakadumog lang gani gi invite. <laughs> Seriously, I know someone like that during college. Like, so popular, you invite, must you What? How? Okay, so we tend to envy people who have a kind of worldly, I don't know if it's called success, but it's parang they arrived in all areas of their life. You know, like everything feels easy for them. Perfect family, perfect romance, perfect barcada, perfect reputation. Like everything's perfect. You know, astang skin, flawless, kilay, for me, ano, sakto, eh. Right? Okay. Uh, now, I say these things because these really are how I feel sometimes. No, no, it sounds so easy to them, huh? 24 years old, owner of a company, starting a new company. First one, already successful. Wow, my merona for the children. Yeah, things like that. The irony, the irony is this. The Edomite race lineage goes all the way. If you trace the lineage, you remember uh, the sermon that Kai preached before about Herod? How terrible he was? Remember that? Okay. The Edomite race lineage goes all the way to Herod the Great who massacred Bethlehem and the babies and Herod Antipas who beheaded John the Baptist and mocked Jesus. That's their lineage. That's their legacy. Chiefs, kings, dynasties, massacred the Bethlehem babies, mocked Jesus. That's their legacy. Suddenly when I think of this, I'm not so envious anymore. I don't want to be in those shoes. 
Let me read three sets of texts in the New Testament. 1 John 2, verse 15 to 17 says this, Do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So all those things will pass away. And when he says here, he says here the world and its desires are passing away, it's both, huh? it's the desires, meaning the object of desires, so the fame, the materials, the blah, 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 and the desire itself, the wanting to be all of this. Because you know when the judgment of God comes? Picture it, when the judgment of God comes, when Jesus comes in all his glory, no one is going to be thinking, I love my Ferrari. <laughs> No one's going to be thinking, oh, what about my, my romance? No, everyone's going to be, oh my, they're right. I will, halaka, I'm doomed. You know, when the lava hits those Teslas, those, you know, the mansions, and the, no one's going to be, oh, my famous barcada, everyone's going to be running for their lives. No one's going to be thinking of those desires. Suddenly, it sounds so pointless, no? James 4, verse 4, says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. What we pursue is so crucial. Are we trying to pursue friendship with the world? Like it's my mga powerful people in the city, kana akong dapat i-friend. Be very careful. That's scary. Romans 12 verse 2 says this, Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, there was a point in my life as a Christian, I say this as a Christian, wala pang NCC, I was still in my very first church, and then I transferred to another megachurch. So from one megachurch to another megachurch. And in the second megachurch, there were some very, very powerful people, like political in the city, you know. And there was a temptation in my heart that said, what if my close ko aning mga tao, no? If I'm close to them, then, you know, they're powerful, influential people in the city, I might get some of that pisik. You know, mapiskan lang gamay. I was seriously tempted. And then, when it was a little, you know, I was I had a friend from another mega church with Chinese people. I'm not going to mention names now. But a mega, 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 mega church with Chinese people who were business owners. And I thought, maybe if I transfer there, you know, and something felt off. Something always felt off because in my heart, I had the wrong intentions. For us today, there's a temptation to grab the promises of victory and triumph, of success and power. And yet, the truth is, there is victory and triumph. But that's over sin and hell, not poverty, not persecution. The reason why the prosperity gospel is so evil is because that is Satan's temptation to Jesus. Remember when Jesus was being tempted? What was the Think about it. Health, wealth, fame, right? Look at the temptation of Satan. You're hungry, aren't you? I hear your stomach grumbling. Check out the stones. You can turn them into bread. What is that? Health. What's next? Look at all the kingdoms in the world. You can have all of this. What is that? Wealth. What's the last one? Jump. Angels will catch you. You're going to levitate. But not like a fake magician, but like a, you know, a real deal. And everyone's going to see you. What is that? Fame. That's in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, right? The world's, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride in possessions. There you go. Satan's tactics has not changed. He used it on Christ. He's using it on us. He's using it on the world. Today we have more subtle forms of the prosperity gospel in our own lives. So don't think oh, we're exempt because we're so anti prosperous Oh, wait. <laughs> it can come in subtle forms like less hardship and more healing. Diba, Lord, I just want less hardship. I'm faithful to you. I'm anti pros boss. Therefore, therefore, no, my therefore, and then blank. What is the blank pros boss? 
in subtle ways. We want less sanctification and more relaxation. Okay? Because sanctification is tiring and hard. Relaxation is easy. But remember, compromise causes catastrophe. Talked about this last week. Contrima co compromise causes catastrophe. Warnings about loving this world and the things of this world are real and they are relevant in our lives. So don't be fooled. We can say we don't love the world while we are running after worldliness. We can say to their mouths, I, I, I don't want that. And then we're running after them in our gripes, in our complaints, in our, you know, kind of scroll ka down sa imuhang social media and your eyebrows are touching na. Lord, why? <laughs> I want my own. All right? So in the end, this is to summarize Isao's life because we're not going to get back to Isao again until we talk about Edom. And it's going to be a reference na lang. Okay, so to summarize Isao's life, juxtaposing it with Jacob's life, just remember who you're with, where you are, and what you're working for. Just be mindful of those three. First, who you're with. Because who you fellowship with determines your faith. Second, where you are. Plant your roots where you're bearing fruits. Lastly, what you're working for. Prioritize God's purposes. And there's a last part there. If you prioritize God's purposes, you will experience His promises. And His promises are always what's good, pleasing, and perfect for you and me. Amen? Let's pray.